Hello, this is Tyler Crone with The Thundering 36. We are so delighted this afternoon to be in a conversation and interviewed Reed Saris, who is running for Office of State Superintendent in Public Instruction. Thank you so much for joining with us. Over to you, Reed. Awesome, yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm a fourth generation Washington public educator. Um, my mom was one of the first women to lead a local teachers union. And uh, I've been a teacher, um, an IB coordinator, an administrator. Um, I built a national nonprofit. And throughout the work, my uh, mission has really been focused on my experiences uh, seeing my best friend and my foster sister sent off on different paths in the public school for no particularly good reason. And because my mom knew the system, she was able to get me access to the best of what our schools had to offer. And I always have been motivated by and wondering why it can't do those same sorts of things for some of our kids. Um, and so we still have huge gaps these days and an ability, I think, to close those. I've dedicated my career to doing that. The nonprofit I built, Equal Opportunity Schools, works with traditional public schools on closing gaps um, for kids of color, low-income students. And uh, I was encouraged to run for this office by President uh, Obama's Secretary of Education, John King, because uh, Washington is a bit of a paradox. We have a uh, strong uh, economy, fastest uh, growing multiple recent years running. We have strong progressive values as a state. We're committed to facts and evidence, and yet we're falling behind so many other states. Um, and so we fell on out of the top set of states these last eight years. Um, even states, uh, the poorest state like Mississippi has passed us by in low income uh, kids' ability to read and math ability overall. Uh, we're down to 40th in youth mental health. Uh, which to me is unacceptable. We have 15% of our adolescents saying they considered suicide last year, and we don't have comprehensive plans to deal with these things. We're not yet implementing the U.S. Surgeon General's guidance on youth mental health, President Biden's guidance on uh, tutoring and support. So there's a lot to do, and uh, happy to talk about that. I also got to see it firsthand uh, back in the classroom at Rainier Beach High School this fall. Thank you so much. Our first question this afternoon will be asked by Laura Marie. So sorry, had trouble with the mute button there. Um, thanks for coming in, Reed. I am a mom of four public school students, and we are asking you, uh, what is the role for OSPI in ensuring the state fulfills its obligation to fully fund education? And what have you done to advocate for this? What's worked? What hasn't? And what new things would you try if you're elected? Great question. Um, yeah, I have three public school kids myself coming up in the system, and um, it's, uh, it's such an important question. I think our challenge has been, um, has been leadership around where resources are going and how we get to that full funding that we're talking about. And so my team completed an analysis recently. We found, uh, schools with significant, uh, populations of low income kids get 16% less money than other schools in our state. I've worked with governors and state chiefs who've overhauled their funding formulas um, and the way to do it right is to spend 30% more in those schools. Um, and to get there, I think we have to rebuild confidence with the state legislature and how OSPI manages overseas and uses funds. So uh, we, they asked, they did an audit of OSPI's use of COVID dollars and asked uh, which investments we made were most effective, where mon more money should be put. To me, that's the perfect question to get from the legislature who is, the, is responsible for appropriating money which things work best that we should put more money in? And the answer was, we don't know, and we're not gonna collect the data to find out. And so we were one of only three states that the US Department of Education cited for mismanaging those dollars. And when this legislature asked where they went, uh, OSPI's answer was that three quarters of the money went to other. And so when I talked to uh, all sorts of legislature, legislators, including leaders um, in Washington state legislature, they're, their notion is, you know, to get to some of the things you're talking about, about full funding and these sorts of things, we just have to build more confidence in what are we doing with those things? What's working? How do we close gaps? How do we ensure those resources reach teachers and kids where they're most needed? Because what we've seen over the last eight years is a significant widening of the achievement gap, this underinvestment in lower income schools, um, multiple rounds of sort of difficulty in getting resources to rural and under-resourced schools, on facilities. And to me, 
leadership is coming up with a broader plan. How far away are we on things like our facilities on a statewide basis? We have the data, but we haven't done the analysis. Um, how far away, like my team I just mentioned, found 16% lower funding for lower income uh, schools? And then what can we do um, to change that trajectory? And so I would get some early wins around mental health, uh, paraeducators and tutoring support for kids, show that we can get things done, like President Obama used to say, um, that uh, if people want to put more money in, you got to show that you're solving their everyday problems. So we'll work to do that, rebuild the confidence and go to a much more uh, significantly effective fun uh, funding formula overall. Thank you. Our next question will be asked by Amanda. Yeah, with the rising trend of vitriolic language, violence and discrimination against LGBTQIA plus students across the country and Washington state, what specific measures are you taking and will you take to ensure that all of these students have access to a safe public education, particularly trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming students? It's a great question um, and really important um, today in particular, I think. And I think we need to be uh, at the OSPI level collecting data, reporting on these issues on an ongoing and regular basis. Um, there's been the start of setting up a hotline to the AG's office to report on some of the hate speech um, and, and hate crimes and those sorts of things, that work is going to be coordinated across agencies. So when it comes from school related contexts, OSPI will be responsible for managing that. Um, I'm concerned that the current administration doesn't have the capacity to really uh, do effective work with that new incoming data. Um, I've gotten to work with folks like Russell and Ali who led the Office of Civil Rights in the US Department of Education under the Obama administration. I think part of it starts when you are reporting on these issues and seeing the trends in the data. So this is true across this issue and many others. OSPI is not really taking the bully pulpit power to say, where is this challenge most severe? Where are people addressing it effectively? What's working about how people are addressing it so we can share those insights with others and solve problems? And that's really where I've spent my career. So I absolutely want to do this work um, in our state for these students. Um, the mental health report I put out with the Children's Alliance um, showed clearly that LGBTQIA plus students are uh, suffering most when it comes to some of these mental and behavioral health challenges, are least access to care, least represented by care providers. Um, and so I put together a comprehensive plan to address those gaps. Other states like uh, Colorado, Hawaii, have taken a stand that they're gonna ensure universal access to care for kids. We can do that here in Washington as well. And then I think it does come back to this piece of how do you actually help schools and districts solve the problem? So that's where mm -hmm. I spent my career on equity issues working. I was hired by more than a thousand school and district superintendents across dozens of states, governors, state chiefs, and otherwise um, to tackle equity issues. And it's one thing to say, I want to advocate for these students. It's the next step to report on the data and be aware of, of exactly how it's playing out for who. And the third step that OSPI just hasn't ever shown the capacity for is how do you actually help them solve the problems on the ground? And that's where I've spent my career doing that work with superintendents around the country and why I have a lot of superintendent of the year endorsements here in Washington. Thank you. I'm asking our next question which is continuing, how can OSPI improve the Title IX process and special education in Washington State? Great questions. Um, so I think on the special ed side, um, the cap is uh, probably both immoral and illegal, in my opinion. You have to fund services under federal laws and regulations for kids who need those services. And I think our failure to do so and the continual failure to do so is a really big problem. Um, I've talked with the heads, uh, the, I've talked recently, for example, with the head of the special ed PTA for uh, Seattle Public sc uh, Schools. Um, and there is just not a, any level of responsiveness or attentiveness to this issue, according to you know their view and many others. I, I won't put her on the spot for quoting her, but you know many people like that, right, or think that there's a really a big challenge and a lack of responsiveness to these issues. Um, and I think, you know, the notion of, well, we we'll get a percent here this year and increase in the cap and another percent another year is not addressing the challenge whatsoever. And so this fits in the theme, I think, uh, Title IX as well of that I was talking about a moment ago of it's one thing to, you know, say I care about this, 
The second thing is exactly where is it playing out? Where are people running up against the caps? How is that playing out for individual kids? Are we reporting on this? Are we talking about it? I've talked with folks in districts and systems where they're actually magnets for special ed because they do great work. And so they vastly exceed the caps, right? These things need to be called out. They need to be talked about and the successes need to be celebrated. So you go from advocacy to being aware of what's happening with which kids where and when. And so I've spent a lot of my time in that data and in that work. And then the third step is the capacity and building the capacity of OSPI like I built at my nonprofit to actually help local leaders solve these challenges. And a lot of the local leaders are spending more time in court defending an inequitable system than it would cost to pay for the services for an equitable system. And as the state schools chief, I'm gonna be the one on top of that data, understanding what's happening and what's working where, so that we can connect those dots and get that work completed. Thank you. Our last prepared question will be asked by Laura Marie. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so what do people not understand about the role of superintendent and uh, what what would you like us to know about that? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so a lot of people have never heard of it and don't know what it is on the one end of the spectrum. Um, and so that's uh, always a challenge in running for a position like this is people say, what the heck is that? Um, and, you know, I since this is publicly released, I don't know what I should say, but I don't know what every official is that's running for every position at a statewide level myself, even though I'm running for office. This is You can't keep up with everything, right? But, and, and the Seattle Times spoke to this recently, people should pay attention to this race and this office because it is the leader responsible for our largest shared project as a state and a society, the education of the rising generation, more than a million kids, almost half of our budget, so it is, it's, it's a big deal. And then on the other side of the spectrum, when people do understand the office, I think a challenge you get is people saying, well, it doesn't have much power, so you can't really hold people in that office responsible for much. And that's part of what I want to change in Washington state. I don't think we need to, we could overhaul the structure. Some people have talked about this sort of thing, but you oversee the $17 billion a year that are going into 295 separate school districts, six tribal compact systems. And you don't, you don't have any magic button where you can go up there and say, you know, do, 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 we're gonna change this, that, and the other. Um, a little bit less power than in a, an average state in the US for this state school's chief in Washington. But it is the position whose occupant should be chiefly responsible for leading our conversations about what's going on in our public schools with our million students. And that's the place where I think we're missing a little bit. We say, oh, the legislature didn't do this, or oh, the local school districts didn't do that. And so OSPI can't be responsible for that. I say I've built a national nonprofit hired by more than a thousand school and district leaders across dozens of states. We had zero power over them. But what we did have is the ability to help them solve problems. So they invited us in, they even hired us and paid for our services because we said, we can help you solve these equity challenges. We can help you close these gaps. We can help you build a better system. And that's the power of the bully pulpit. I think you'll get breakthroughs with superintendents from this new type of leadership. And then also with the legislature who's looking for solutions and looking for leadership. So my first follow-up will be kind of leaping off this point. Um, as a Seattle public school parent and as someone who has had a child in our Seattle public school since 2008, I am deeply alarmed to see the free fall um, and the closure of schools and the exit of a lot of families from our schools. So this is a very open-ended broad question, but sure. in particular focusing on the news last week, what are some of your thoughts and reactions coming into this run and into this role? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so the uh, suggestion of closing 20 schools is now on the table. Again, I think it's, yeah, and you're right to say building on the, the previous topic and conversation here, because I think the challenge of so many of the things and why our schools do hit spirals and free falls like this relates to this question of leadership. And so in Seattle, they say, well, we didn't get what we needed from the legislature and OSPI. In OSPI, and they say, well, Seattle didn't, you know, manage their things right. Uh, and then the reporter is saying, well, historically, you know, we didn't get the forecasting right. Somebody should have the visibility and awareness 
of what's going on and tracking the data and being aware. And I think that's the role and the promise of the position of superintendent of public instruction to do that. And so when we sort of are facing these closures, when we're facing these huge budget deficits in so many districts that are causing school closures, layoffs, and otherwise, uh, I think the answer that I heard from, uh, from the state superintendent was, well, it's just a perfect storm that happened. And to me, that's true if you don't have anybody at the helm who's forecasting the weather. And to me, the job is to be seeing what's coming, be aware of that and supporting the progression and change that's needed. And so that to me, when it comes to the budget and any of these other things, yes, there was a Seattle Times piece on it and other things to look back at the history. The state schools chief should be telling those stories of what's happened in the past, what's happening in other school districts nearby. What can we do about it? What should we expect? How should we resource this? I think one of the things that I would propose and have had supportive conversations with folks in the legislature about is a way to stabilize given the enrollment declines. We're halfway through a 10% forecasted enrollment decline and there are creative ways to stabilize that while we plan for the future and have greater visibility into what's gonna happen next. Thank you. The next follow-up question will be asked by Amanda. Yeah, um, another thing that happened recently in the Seattle School District, but I think it applies to a lot of districts all over, um, is kind of our evolving understanding or approach to gifted education yep. and uh, moving for, for a variety of, of reasons, uh, particularly equity um, and um, uh, for for all students and um, access to that, uh, to those programs. What's uh, your approach on that and your, your thinking and how does the Office of Super, the the public instruction, how does that able to support districts as they navigate this for their own district? Yeah, it's such a good question. And I know people have a lot of concerns about that issue um, in a variety of ways. And I think it fits exactly with this theme. So the notion is we have to close gifted programs in Seattle because they're inequitable. The conversation has not spanned just literally across the southern border of Seattle into the Renton School District, where they have a gifted program that is in fact reflective of the diversity of the students in the district, and in that sense, equitable. So the idea of that insularity of 295 separate conversations, six, six tribal compact system conversations happening by themselves, yes, very often, we don't know what we could do. There's no way we could make it equitable and solve this challenge. But if you have the visibility of what others have done, and then across the lake in Bellevue, they had a big push of expanding access to gifted, and they grew the program, and they thought about it in new and creative ways. And so I think that's what we need to be doing is saying, what are the solutions? And you need an educator. You need somebody who's got the expertise of how these things actually work in schools for superintendents and to solve these challenges. And when you don't have that, what ends up happening is, oh, we're stuck. We're stuck on the budget, it was a perfect storm. Oh, we're stuck on, on gifted program because it's not equitable and there's nothing we can do about it. And what ends up happening is, is teachers pay the consequences. And so there was a Seattle Times article about the gifted program closing. Their example was, well, teachers will just take care of it and the gifted programs will sit in the corner, uh, gifted kids will sit in the corner on their own and read without support from the teacher was the example. And so Good luck to teachers in managing it. That's what I found as a teacher in the classroom. They just say, you take care of it and figure it out without the support needed. Thank you. Our last follow-up today will be from Laura Marie. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate your thoughts on special education and gifted education and the budget, but I'm really concerned. Um, OSPI estimates that the charter schools cost SPS around 15 million each year. And we understand that you support them. And if Washington State Dems, Casey Dems, and the teachers unions oppose them, I'm wondering if you can share why you think the party is wrong to oppose them. Uh, I do not support charter schools. So I'm glad for the opportunity to clear that up. I've never worked with a charter school. I've never advocated for charter schools. Um, sometimes people look at the name of my nonprofit and it sounds like it might be a charter school, but it was uh, partnered with traditional public schools uh, exclusively under my leadership. So yeah, I think, I think charters, you know, they, uh, I think it's 18 schools with uh, less than half a percent of the students in our system. We need to focus on traditional public schools and supporting what goes on there. I think the role of the state superintendent includes sitting on the charter commission. So there is an oversight responsibility there, but I am not an advocate for expanding it. I don't think it's the solution to our problems. Um, and appreciate the opportunity to clarify that. 
Thanks. Thank you so much. This will conclude the formal part of our interview.